is kind of hard to see, um, but it's got a, quite a few uh, vocabulary terms, um, growth rate, total fertility rate, replacement level fertility, um, infant mortality, population profile, um, population momentum, um, crude birth rate, crude death rate, epidemiologic transition, fertility transition, demographic transition. Those are all things that you'll want to make sure that you know um, these terms from this unit. Um, so even if you can't quite see them, um, you can at least, um, you know, uh, look, look up the answer or look up the definition. So first we're going to talk about like natural populations and then we'll talk about humans. Um, so uh, a population growth curve is just a, a graph of how a population is going to grow. And so um, something, we see this orange one, constant growth. This is not found in nature. So it's kind of like a, um, kind of like a null hypothesis where um, it's just not, um, it doesn't happen a lot. So we have a couple different kinds. We have this J-curve. This is like exponential growth. Um, this is like bacteria populations. Um, they grow really, really fast. And a lot of times this, this dotted line right here is called the carrying capacity, and that's how many individuals the environment can support. So exponential growth happens so quickly, it often overshoots the carrying capacity and then ends up crashing. The population ends up crashing. That's when we talked about eutrophication a little bit, that's um, basically what happens to the algae populations. Um, and then we have this S-curve, and this is um, basically normal growth or logistic growth where you're growing and then as you meet the, um, um, as you get to the carrying capacity, growth uh, slows down. Um, and they call the exponential growth a J-curve because the curve, you know, kind of looks like a J. And they call the logistic growth an S-curve because, you know, it kind of looks like an S. Um, so sometimes things in science make sense. Okay, so here's exponential growth. That's going to result in a population explosion, like I was saying. It's going to overshoot the carrying capacity. It's going to grow really, really fast. Um, we can talk about something called R max, which is the number of offspring individuals can produce in a given amount of time if resources are unlimited. Um, and so you can kind of use um, this equation at the bottom to get that R max. Um, I have not seen this equation on the AP exam before, but you know, just for a uh, um, for your knowledge. Um, and this is common with like bacteria. algae, things with really um, really short generation times that just double quickly. Um, so R is basically um, this term that we use in populations. Um, organisms with a high R value are going to grow faster than those with a low R value. So for example, um, a high R you know, again, that's like bacteria, um, you know, like clams, insects, um, algae, those sorts of things, where um, a low R is going to be things, you know, like um, pandas, cheetah, Um, Gooper, things like that. Um, what's interesting is the human population actually has a low R. We don't have tons of babies, each human, but our population as a whole acts like a high R population, which is very interesting, which we'll, we'll get to in a second. Um, the carrying capacity is just the maximum number, um, maximum population of the species, maximum individuals 
that a habitat can support without being degraded over the long term. And so we put, we consider this sustainable. Okay, so if you if these guys they overshot their carrying capacity, they're they're going to run out of resources, and the um, they're going to die at least a few of them, and um, drop back. It's not uncommon to see populations kind of do something like that, and then they start growing fast again, and then you know do stuff like that. Um, so. Um, there's a couple ways that we um, grow. We can keep growing until we exhaust all of our resources and then die up due to starvation, which is what I was talking about with the how the population can cr crash, or slow population growth, so then it kind of levels off near the carrying capacity. So logistic growth, this is um, growth pattern number two. What's interesting is um, logistic growth. As the population nears the carrying capacity, Growth will slow until the population growth actually equals zero. And the maximum rate of the population growth occurs halfway to K. So this area right here is going to be max growth. Here it's kind of ramping up. And here it's slowing down. Okay, so here's this crash I was telling you about in um exponential growth and then log logistic growth, sometimes it'll overshoot a little bit, but it kind of stays right around that carrying capacity. Um, I feel like I just said that. Um, so biotic potential is an interesting term, and it's basically the rate at which members of the species reproduce. Okay, so this is, um, it's a positive thing. So, um, there are um, extra resources in the environment, um, things like that, that will increase your biotic potential. And then your recruitment is the survival through early growth stages to become part of the breeding population. So, you know, when you're born, you're not immediately part of the breeding population, right? You have to, um, you have to grow until you reach um, maturity. And so if you, <laughs> if you grow to maturity, then, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, if you grow to maturity, then they've considered that you, you, you know, you're part of the recruitment population. And then environmental resistance is kind of the opposite of biotic potential. So anything that's going to limit your population increase. So um, disease, predators, um, if you have like a natural disaster, anything that's going to limit your population increase is going to be environmental resistance. So environmental resistance is, you know, reduces the population size and biotic potential will increase the population size. So now let's talk about our strategists. Remember, these are guys that um, grow really fast, their population increases really, really fast. Um, so what are some things that these guys do? Um, they produce large amounts of young, but they leave survival in nature. So they don't have a lot of parental care. They just kind of like put their seeds out there, put their babies out there, and hopefully they survive like insects, things like that. Um, these guys often have low recruitment. So, you know, if you're a frog and you produce 100 eggs, not all 100 frogs, their babies are going to survive to adulthood, maybe just like, you know, 13 or, you know, maybe sometimes even less. Um, these guys are going to reproduce really, really fast. So like I was talking about bacteria, they have like a really fast generation time, so they'll go really fast. Um, a lot of times these have a short lifespan. They don't live very long, so they need to reproduce quickly. Um, oftentimes they're very small. 
They have huge boom and bust populations. So for example, when we talk, to, talk about eutrophication, and the algae just grows really um, crazy. And then um, the area runs out of oxygen and, um, or nutrients, and the algae die. Um, and then we, these are considered weedy or opportunistic species. And um, they're often invasive species. So an invasive species is one that doesn't belong in an environment, but it's, it's kind of, um, it's, it's arrived there somehow, and it's hanging out, and it's doing really, really well. In fact, it's doing too well, and it's kind of displacing native, native uh, populations. Um, you know, all of these... All of these characteristics are also characteristics that would make a critter or like a plant survive really, really well in an environment that is not um, their natural one. Case strategists is technically what we are. Um, they have a low reproductive rate, but they care, they protect their young um, until the young can compete with adults for resources. Um, so a lot of these big charismatic megafauna, a lot of times they're case strategists. Um, endangered species are often case strategists because they um, they uh, it takes them a long time to reproduce, and so or they're and they're really big, and so it's easy for them to be hunted, and then they take you know they're pretty old when they have babies. This is, they really work best in a stable environment. You're not going to see case strategists usually as invasive species. Um, they're really well adapted to normal environmental fluctuations, but anything, you know, apart from that natural, that normal fluctuation is going to cause them some issues, and it'll be difficult for them to adapt to that. So, um, for example, like climate change and things like that. Now, um, so survivorship curves, we can look at these, and this will kind of show us how many babies survive. So for example, um, a um, R strategist is going to start out with a lot, a lot, a lot of babies, and then not so many adults, right? They're gonna, there's going to be a lot of die-off in the beginning, OK? And K strategists. There's not so much die-off in the beginning, but there is, you know, some decent die-off in old age, this old lady. Um, and then intermediate, that's somewhere in between where they kind of just follow this steady pattern and they kind of die, I guess, at, um, at similar rates throughout their lifespan. Okay, so human population growth. This graph shows the human population and it's kind of crazy because um, basically this is where you're starting and this is where you're ending. We're actually past this now. Um, so you can see we have this crazy exponential growth right here. Okay, so even though we're K strategists, we have this J curve um, and we're just like keep growing exponentially. So that's kind of an oddity about the human population is that we're, um, we have individual characteristics of case strategists, but our population as a whole um, looks like an R strategist um, population. And so we don't fit either model perfectly, but we act, we act more like case strategists, but this is something that, he, that scientists and other folks are worried about, is they're worried that we're going to, you know, overshoot our carrying capacity, and then the po human population is going to crash. Okay, um, so they're hoping that the human population is going to level off at the carrying capacity. They think it's around 10 billion, but really nobody knows what the carrying capacity is. Um, so some interesting thing about humans is we can act as local and a global population. We can regulate our reproduction. We can say, no, we don't want to have kids anymore. We're done. Or we can say, let's have some more. And we can do fertility treatments and things like that. Um, we can use fire. We can store food for really long periods of time. We have refrigerators and pantries and 
ways to um, preserve food. And um, we can adapt to our environment using technology. So for example, folks live in, you know, near the equator where it's very, very hot. And they've also, you know, have base stations in Antarctica where, you know, with coats and heat and things like that, humans can survive there as well. So when we talk about what's limiting human population growth or, or populations in general, not just the human population, um, we have to talk about the law of limiting factors. And basically, this is when um, your population is going to increase until it reaches a limit. When that limit is removed, the population is going to increase some more until there's a new limit. So for example, um, let's say a, a waterway had um, didn't have any nitrogen added to it. There was no runoff or anything. You would have a certain population of algae. We add nitrogen to that system, and the population will grow until it you know, uses up all that nitrogen. And then if we were to add even more nitrogen, then it would grow even some more. Um, and so whatever was limiting in that environment, if you add more, the population will grow until something else is limiting. Um, so some things that limit um, the human population is pollution. It also limits, you know, other populations as well. Um, the amount of agricultural land available, the amount of fish in the ocean, and then um, ecosystems that we need for services, like we need to build houses on and use for agricultural and things like that, plus also like land water for human activities to drink, things like that. So. Do we have a carrying capacity? We don't know. Um, they're thinking maybe, um, but they're not really sure. But they're thinking if we keep growing at our current rate, the population will be greater than the carrying capacity before 2050. So that's not that long. That's like in your lifetime, right? That's hopefully my lifetime too. So, these are some interesting numbers. So the human population, in order to go from 1 billion to 2 billion, it took 100 years. And then to add another billion, 2 billion to 3 billion, it took 30 years. And then 3 billion to 4 billion, it took 15. And then 4 to 5 is 12, 5 to 6 is 12, and then 6 to 7 is 13. So you can see we're kind of, you know, we're kind of leveling off here. So maybe we are kind of, you know, our, our J curve is kind of starting to go like this. Maybe. So, um, now we can talk about different types of countries because we're going to compare countries and we're going to do this a lot. You're going to do it on the AP exam and you're going to do it a lot in this unit. Um, so, high income, highly developed, industrialized, like the United States, for example, is known as a developed country. They don't like using like third world countries anymore because it's like your ranking countries. Um, your per capita income has to be 11,000 and greater. So that's actually not that much, right? That's, that's below poverty level in a lot of places in America. And about a little over a billion people on the planet are in this, this section right here. Um, middle income, moderately developed, these folks are going to have between $3,700 a year and $11,455 a year. That is not a lot of money to live on. Okay, and that's uh, about 4.26 billion folks. And then low income and developing, um, their per capita income is less than $1,000, less than $936 a year. Okay, that is hardly anything. Um, I bet your parents spend more than that a month on bills and things like that. Um, and that's about $1.3 billion or 1.3 billion folk, uh, people. Um, the green countries are the high income countries and they're about 15% of the human population. They're 80% of the wealth. So just like in America, we talk about how the richest 1% has so much more money than everyone else. It's the same thing on the planet. And we're actually in that section. We're in that group, all of us. 
um, and then low-income countries are about 37% of the population, but only 3% of the wealth. Okay, that's not a lot of money to be split among 37% of 7 or 8 billion people. Um, unfortunately, still, even though we have all this money compared to everyone in the rest of the world, 10 to 15% of people in developed countries can't afford adequate food, shelter, or clothing. And then 45% of people in developing countries can't afford food, shelter, or clothing. This is actually places that they live. And you can see it's like cardboard boxes and stuff. Like, it's not um, super sturdy. And that's why, you know, when natural disasters hit places like that, it really just devastates them because, you know, a cardboard box isn't going to stand um, stand up to a hurricane or something like that. So high-income countries are growing at a rate of 0.1% per year. Middle and low-income countries is, are growing at a rate of 1.5% per year. So the problem is that 98% of our population growth is occurring in developing countries, these poorest countries. So that's even less money for those to go around for those folks and a lot of this is because um, they don't have birth control um, there's not a lot of education for women or women's health care so they can't decide okay i'm done i don't want any kids anymore there's not a lot of times um, the more educated a woman is she's going to put off having children and that's not happening in those uh, developing countries so your total fertility rate is the average number of children each woman in a population has over her lifetime. In general, more than two, it's like 2.4 or something like that. It's going to give you a growing population, and you can't have 0.4 of a kid, but, you know, averaged out. And that's because, you know, unfortunately not all children live to adulthood. And so that allows for that um, little bit of um, wiggle room there. And then um, less than two, it's going to give you a declining population. And there are some countries that do have declining populations. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, so, and your replacement level fertility, again, that's just going to replace the parents. That's going to keep the population just steady. So you can see, like, um, Australia is like 1.78, um, China is 1.79, Hong Kong is 1.02. You know, those, those population should be shrinking. Pakistan is 3.43. That, that population is going to be increasing. So um, in general, in developed countries, fertility rates have declined over the past um, 200 years. And um, again, we talked about this. They're more educated. Um, there's more, um, you know, you can, they have more ability to decide when they're having children. They have birth control. Um, and that's why, for example, like a lot of countries will offer um, like benefits for parents for having children. So, for example, I have two kids. I can write them off on my taxes. And so that's a benefit the United States government is giving me for having children because, you know, they need to have that replacement level. Otherwise, the population of the country will shrink. And if that happens then you're not going to have enough people to take over jobs. These, um, as old folks retire, you don't have people kind of taking over these the jobs that they used to be doing. Um, and so it's important to, countries don't like to have a negative population growth. Um, in developing countries, the fertility rates are about 2.8, but some of them are as high as 6.8. That's huge, right? That's going to um, have a lot of kids. And about 82% of the population is in developing countries. And by 2075, it's expected that 90% of the human population is going to live in these very, very, very poor countries. So um, this is kind of a song that was really popular when I was in school. Um, so not everything is great when you have you, you live in a country that has a lot of money. Um, there are some problems. For example, um, the, uh, the population can put some pressure on the environment, affluence, uh, technology. All of these can maybe like hurt the environment. 
And so they have something called the IPAT formula, which is the environmental impact of your I. And it's equal to your population times your affluence slash consumption pattern. For example, if you have more money, you're likely to maybe burn more fossil fuels and um, technology. And so then we can talk about our ecological footprint. I know some of y'all have been doing your, your uh, water footprint, but you can actually do your total ecological footprint that shows, um, you know, how, how much you're using, for example, um, on the planet. And so um, in the USA, only 4.5, we're only about 4.5% of the population, yet we're responsible for 22%. Of CO2 emissions. So again, that's that's a lot of carbon dioxide that we're emitting into the environment, and it's more than our share of people. And that's because we're more affluent, and so we um, we tend to buy more things. Um, and now we can talk about population profiles. These are very very important. Um, you're likely to see one of these on the um, the AP exam. Um, there have been FRQs with population profiles. Sometimes they ask you to draw one. Uh, so it's really important that you understand them. Um, sometimes they just show you them and they want you to kind of read them. So your longevity is a lifetime of an individual, how, how long you're going to live. And so a population profile basically is like a sideways bar graph. And it's showing the number of people at each age for a given population. Sometimes they're called age structure diagrams as well. So for example, um, this graph, for example, we have a little over 10 million people in the zero to four category for males and just at 10 million in the zero to four category for females. And um, a lot of times, the bottom of a population profile is very wide because you have more kids. And then as you get older, people die. And so that's why, you know, towards the top, it's going to be a little skinnier because, um, you know, people, the longer you live, see, this is like the very top on this one, it's 85 plus. So these are the people that have grown, you know, that are at least 85 years old. So there's not going to be as many of them because, you know, throughout the years, people from that, what they call cohort, have died off. Um, and there's some interesting patterns that you can see in these graphs. Even if you're not looking at the numbers specifically, you're just looking at the shape of the graph. So, um, for example, this one is the United States in 1985. And you see that um, there's some babies, but there's this weird thing where you have these people that are between 25 and 39 and 85. And these people are um, that part kind of of the graph kind of like, poops out a little bit. And what that is, is those are the returning veterans from World War II. They had the baby boom. They had lots of babies because they were coming back from war and they were, you know, their wives were so excited to see them, whatever. And then you can also see um, here, you know, it gets really skinny right there for a few years. And that's, those were folks that were born during the Great Depression. And there weren't a lot of um, people born during the Great Depression because there wasn't a lot of resources and so families you know didn't have children because they couldn't afford it um, this is something uh, they call graying of the population you see this graph it's kind of not what you expect right the ones we've looked at before because the bottom is really skinny and then as they get older it gets more it gets larger and so what's happening here is this is because um, the proportion of old people in the population is increasing, but the birth rate, you know, they're not having enough babies to support the um, population. So this is, again, when uh, governments are going to start having policies to encourage you to have more children. For example, in the United States, you get a tax break for having children, like I said earlier. Um, that's, that's a policy to encourage you to have more children. Um, and Italy is really the most notable example um, for graying of the population. Now, a developing country, they have a really characteristic graph. And what happens here is most of the population is very, very young. In fact, 
40 to 50 percent of the population are below 15. And the reason is in lots and lots of babies in these developing countries, we talked about that, um, you know, with the lack of women's health care and the lack of women's education and things like that, and birth control. And so they're having lots and lots of babies. But because these countries are very difficult to live in, there, there's, you know, they don't have a lot of resources. It's not super clean. We looked at those, you know, those like cardboard houses. Um, these, they don't often survive into adulthood. They don't have really great medical care. And so a lot of the children die. And so that's why they have these really wide bases. And then they go up to a very skinny top. Um, and the top is usually very, very skinny because not, see this one, it doesn't even have the 85 plus. It's just 80 plus because there's so few people that get that old in, envir in uh, countries or environments like that. Um, so then we can talk about population momentum, which is a really cool um, concept. Um, and it's basically the effect of current age structures on future populations. So for example, um, let's say we looked back at that last graph where they had lots and lots of babies. Even if they stopped having babies or they reduced their population, um, their amount of babies that they have, because they still have all those little babies, they're going to start growing to adulthood. And so your, um, you know, that that wide lower one is going to start marching upward. You know, and so they call that population momentum. In an older population, it's going to be a little different. You're not going to have it's it's population momentum in the other direction that's kind of causing you to like lose people. So it's it's really interesting um, concept. So um, this is just some last minute stuff I wanted to add to this unit. So I don't have really great pictures. But um, immigration, and this is immigration with an I, is when you're migrating to a new area. So let's say, um, you know, we live here. This is a little person. And they move. To a new area, right? You're moving into I for into I for I migration, and for you'll see for in a second why I call it I migration, and it's really pronounced immigration. So I for into means you're moving into another population. This population is going to increase. Okay, now. Emigration, and I'm going to say it immigration because these two words are pronounced the same technically, immigration and immigration. And so I like to call it immigration and immigration when I'm talking about it, so you know which one I'm talking about. So immigration is when you're living in an area and you leave it. Okay, so you're exiting. And um, it's immigration. See, E for exit, E for immigration. Now, and that's going to cause the population to increase. Now, this top one, right, he's migrating into, so this population is going to increase. He's immigrating, I'm migrating into this population, and he's emigrating from this area, right? Same thing. We're emigrating from this circle on the left. I'm going to make a square to the square population on the right, or you're emigrating into the square population. Okay, so both scenarios, you can have both of them in the same scenario. Um, when you're emigrating from somewhere you're exiting, this population is going to decrease, and this one's going to increase. And that makes sense, right? Because you're leaving the one on the left and you're going into the one on the right. So you're increasing that population. Um, then we can talk about uh, population growth rate. And I'm going to do a couple problems for you. Um, you might see problems like this on the um, AP exam. And so. Um, I'm going to just through them for you. Um, and your formula is population growth rate equals the crude birth rate 
plus your immigration, right, because immigration is going to increase your population, minus the crude death rate plus the immigration, because remember, immigration is going to um, reduce your population. Okay? So, um, let's try this one out. So, let's see. We have a CBR of 2, a, I'm going to call it IMM of 1, a CDR of 1, and an EM, immigration, of 1. So my population growth rate is going to be equal to my crude birth rate, 2, plus my immigration, minus my crude death rate, plus my immigration. So then we'll have 3 minus 2. So our population growth rate will be 1%. Okay? And I would expect you to have a, pot, a question like this on the AP exam because it's, um, you know, you can do that without a calculator. I did it without a calculator. And so this, would, um, this population would be increasing. Okay, so let's try the next one. Um, we have a crude birth rate of 1%, an immigration of 1%, a crude death rate of 2%, and an immigration rate of 2%. Okay, so our population growth rate is going to be equal to 1 plus 1 minus 2 plus 2. So we're going to have 2 minus 4, which will give us a negative 2%. Okay, since it's a negative, this population is going to be decreasing. Because the factors that increase the death rate or increase the population size are smaller than the factors that reduce the population size. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the demographic transition, and this is going to be really important. I'm going to show you a graph for the demographic transition, and for your AP exam, I would know how to draw that graph, and I would know what each section on the graph represents, and I'll show it to you in a second. Um, so the demographic transition is just a gradual shift in birth and death rates from what they call primitive to modern or industrialized societies, um, and it, discussed, it, looked, it shows the crude birth rate which is the number of births per, per thousand of, peop, uh, of the population per year, and the crude death rate. So, the demographic transition. Um, basically, in, um, in phase one, this is like pre-industrial, the birth rates are high, and the death rates are high. They're having lots and lots of babies, but lots and lots of babies are dying. And this is, if you remember, and this is kind of what we talked about in the developing countries. Right? We talked about how they had lots of babies, but then those babies didn't often survive to adulthood. Then we have this epidemiologic transition. Basically, um, we're starting to get better medical care. Okay, so the mortality or the death rate is going down, but that um, birth rate is still really high. Um, they haven't quite gotten the memo that um, they don't need to have as many kids because their other kids aren't dying. For example, um, in pre-industrial societies, a lot of times they would have a lot of kids to help around the farm. Well, um, and sometimes those kids wouldn't necessarily survive to adulthood, so... Basically, they would have backup kids. You've even heard of this, like in the royal family, they talk about an heir and a sir, right? Two kids. Um, so in the epidemiologic transition, we're getting better medical care. 
So our mortality rates are going down. And we haven't quite got the memo that we don't need to have as many babies, so the birth rate stays really, really high. So you're going to have a large amount of population growth, and that's why this is, you know, really big in here. Is because um, not many people are dying, but we're still having lots of babies, so your population is going to grow really rapidly. Then we have something called the fertility transition, where people start having less babies. Um, in these developed countries, you'll notice that um, they start having less babies, the women are more educated, um, they aren't necessarily married off as early, um, they, can, they have access to birth control, um, and they can decide, I want to wait to have children until I'm older, I want to not have kids at all, for example, my sister. She doesn't want any kids. So I have two. My other sister has one. And my other sister, I have, I have two sisters, she doesn't want any kids. And so, you know, she can make that decision in this society where if she lived maybe in a pre-industrial, her dad, my dad may have, like, married her off to someone and she wouldn't get a choice as to how many kids she wanted. She would just have children. So this fertility transition decreased the death rate. or decrease, The birth rate is decreasing. So the amount of um, population growth is starting to decrease as well. And then the last phase, they call that post-industrial. Um, is very stable. Again, low death rates and low birth rates. If you remember the United States, what our, um, our fertility rate was like 2.1 or something like that, right around replacement level fertility, so that's really close to, um, you know, what's going to keep the population at a steady size. So you should know how, for the AP exam, you should know how to draw this graph and what's happening in each phase, okay? That's going to be really important. They'll ask you about the um, um, demographic transition, which is what this graph is called. And they may not show you the graph. They may ex they're going to expect you to know what it looks like. And um, you know, so you sh so I tell my students that they should know how to draw it. So that way, if you need to, you can sketch it out real quick on your exam, and then you have something to a visual to kind of look at as you're answering questions about the demogra demographic transition. So in the boxes, I have the most important part for each one. So phase one is high crude birth rate offset by a high crude death rate. So you're not, not a lot of growth. Um, in phase two, you're going to have a declining death rate, but you're still going to have that high, um, that high um, birth rate. In phase three, you're starting to have that low birth rate now. Your birth rate is declining. And your death rate's already down. And so your population growth is, is kind of decreasing. And then in the last one, you have a low crude death rate and a low crude birth rate. So really, we do have some developing countries here. And these are going to be um, the very poorest. And these are going to be like those like medium poor that we talked about. You know, they survive on like $3,700 a year, something like that. And then these are the developed, which is like, you know, um, a lot of the European countries, the United States, places like that. And then the last one is um, your doubling time. So to calculate the doubling time of a population, you're going to use the formula 70 divided by the percent growth rate. Now. Do you remember the crude birth rate um, immigration formula we, we did just a couple of slides ago? They're not going to give you that formula on the AP exam. They're going to expect you to memorize that. You need to know that formula. Same with this formula. They're not going to give you this formula on the AP exam. They're going to expect you to know how to calculate doubling time. So you might have a multiple choice question that says, what is the doubling time of a population that has a percent growth rate of 5? Okay. So to calculate that, You 
you're just going to do 70 divided, oops, 70 divided by 5, which is, uh, I'm going to do it on my hand, like 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, 70, so 14. So the doubling time for this population is 70 years, or 14 years. And that's not very much, but you know, 5% growth rate, that's a really high growth rate, right? Remember that? Now this one, this is even higher growth rate, right? Seventy divided by ten. That's gonna be seven years. Okay, that's gonna be even faster. Right, so in mo most likely um, your doubling time for developed countries is going to be pretty low. And your doubling time for um, developing countries is going to be pretty high because they're having more babies. So the percent growth rate is higher. So that is um, all I have for you today.